Welcome everyone. My name is Jen Sharon, NHA's Chief Operating Officer and your moderator for today's education session, Parental Nutrition, a deep dive into injectable lipid emulsion and the use of alternative lipid formulations in the adult and pediatric population. Say that five times fast, I dare anyone. This is funded by an educational grant from Presenius Academy and we are deeply, deeply grateful for their participation. Just a couple of housekeeping reminders. The presentation and speaker bios are available for download from the handout section of the navigation pane. The webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to you following the conclusion of the webinar and will also be available via NHI's website within the next 24 hours. In order to receive CE, please follow the link in the follow-up email and complete a short quiz. Following the presentation, we will have time to answer your questions. Please submit your questions via the question tab in the navigation pane at any time. Okay, now on to our presentation. Our two speakers today are expert nutrition support clinicians. They will be collaborating to bring you information from both perspective of a pharmacist and dietitian. Meredith Wood Mastika is the Regional Director of Nutrition Support and Strategic Partnerships at New England Life Care. Joining her today is Beth Kerbo, PharmD, New England Life Care's lead clinical pharmacist. We have a lot to cover today, so I'm going to turn it over to Meredith. Excellent. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we hope that this will be an interesting and informative discussion on alternative lipid emulsions. We've also included some general information on parenteral nutrition and then more specifically on um, ILE and fatty acids. So Beth and I are happy to be here and we're pleased to represent New England Life Care today. <laughs> Trying to advance our slide. There it is. Um, we wanna note that Beth and I have no conflicts of interest or financial interest in any product or service that is mentioned in this program. So today we hope to provide a broad range of topics and to cover areas um, that will be of interest to everyone. We're going to start with an introduction of parental nutrition, lipid injectable emulsions, and fatty acids. And then we're going to dig a little bit deeper to discuss ILE currently available for use in both the adult and pediatric populations, um, their indications, and then proper dosing. Beth is going to spend a little bit of time on administration and best practices in the home. And we'll end with a discussion on monitoring PN in the home with one case study. Okay, just a few basics. Um, we know that parenteral nutrition is a feeding modality that bypasses the GI tract. It was developed in 1967 um, by Dr. Stanley Dudrick at the University of Pennsylvania. And we know that it was truly a transformative treatment option for patients that would not have survived um, originally. Um, prevailing dogma in the medical community in the 1960s was that even attempting IV nutrition was impossible or impractical, and even if they could do it, it would definitely be unaffordable. Um, but it was Dr. Dudrick's work that led to the development of the advancement of hyperalimentation um, in children and adults. So you know that PN solutions provide the necessary macronutrients, vitamins, and minerals, um, and they most often contain a combination of dextrose, amino acids, lipids, vitamins, minerals, and trace elements. We know that in 2017, Aspen and the FDA um, announced that they were going to have a change in nomenclature for the IV fat emulsion, which was broken down as IVFE. The impetus for change was for enhanced patient safety and the prevention of medical errors. The previous terminology of IVFE for IV fat emulsion um, was kind of confusing and there was concern that it would be confused with IV iron, which was IVFE. Um, so the new terminology, lipid injectable emulsion, um, started at that time. You'll hear us use the, um, the term ILE or the, um, the shorter version throughout this presentation. Okay. Lipids represent one component of a parenteral nutrition solution. They're a dense source of calories, they provide nine kilocals per gram, and they allow for lesser amounts of intravenous dextrose to be needed. Um, also, they provide a ready, ready source of essential fatty acids. 
fatty acids are a necessary source of cellular energy. They are found in our diet and can be provided either orally or, prevent, or parenterally. They're important components of cellular membranes and they're precursors to modulators and signalers that are important in immune function, inflammatory response, platelet aggregation, neurotransmitter release, among other things. Um, these modulators formed by fatty acid metabolism have been shown to have either pro-inflammatory, inflammatory neutral, or anti-inflammatory activity. Fatty acids in general are classified based on the number of carbons they contain, the number of double bonds present in their formula, and the position of the first double bond in their structure. Based on the number of carbon atoms, they're classified as either short chain, medium chain, long chain, or very long chain. The number of double bonds present in their structure determines if they're saturated with no double bonds, monounsaturated, containing just one double bond, or polyunsaturated, meaning they have two or more double bonds. The position of the first double bond determines their class. The three main classes are the omega-3s, which are long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, namely alpha linolenic acid, the omega-6 fatty acids, which are long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, and we know most commonly linoleic acid. The last main class would be the omega-9 fatty acids, which is a long chain monounsaturated fatty acid group uh, we know as oleic acid. Most fatty acids can be synthesized in the human body, but both linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid cannot. They have to come from dietary sources, and thus we refer to them as essential fatty acids. Commercial intravenous lipid emulsions are formulated as triglycerides in a phospholipid emulsion. The triglycerides are composed of different fatty acids, which are determined by the oil source that's used. Different oils provide differing amounts of omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9 fatty acids. The inflammatory properties of fatty acid metabolites differ between these classes. And the development of alternative and novel ILEs has allowed for the type of fatty acids and the ratios of those fatty acids present to be varied, possibly promoting therapeutic effects of the different fatty acid types. This picture shows a very basic diagram of fatty acid metabolism for omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9 fatty acids. Omega-6 linoleic acid, shown in the middle, is metabolized to arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is the precursor for prostaglandins, prostacyclins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes that have, more, that have been shown to have more pro-inflammatory properties. And they go on to impact processes in the body like coagulation, immune function, and vasoconstriction. The alpha-3 alpha linolenic acid is metabolized to icosapentaenoic acid, also known as EPA, which is much easier to say, <laughs> then further to docosahexaenoic acid, or DHA, and then on to the prostaglandins, prostacyclins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes that have been shown to have less inflammatory and maybe even anti-inflammatory properties. The omega-9 oleic acid utilizes the same enzymes as the omega-3 and omega-6s in their metabolism um, and is metabolized to form mead acid. Omega-9 fatty acids are deemed to be inflammatory neutral. The enzymes in these processes prefer omega-3 to omega-6 to omega-9 fatty acids. That preference, however, can depend on the amount of fatty acid substrate that's available. So if omega-6 fatty acids are available in higher amounts, 
they'll overtake that metabolic pathway of the omega-3s and more arachidonic acid will be produced. If EPA and DHA are supplemented directly from dietary or supplement sources, they can compete and inhibit the formation of arachidonic acid. Other components um, in ILEs that may have an impact on physiological functions are the phytosterols and alpha tocopherols. Phytosterols are plant sterols that are naturally pleasant, present in plant oils. When they're ingested from an oral diet, they're minimally absorbed from the GI tract. But when we give them intravenously, we obviously are putting them directly into the bloodstream and have a much higher concentration. They do require hepatobiliary clearance, and they can accumulate in the liver, decrease bile acid synthesis, and possibly contribute to um, intestinal failure associated liver disease. Um, alpha tocopherol, also known as vitamin E, is an active form of vitamin E. It's present in fish oils and to a lesser extent in plant oils. It's a powerful antioxidant and it can help to prevent cell damage from lipid peroxidation and free radicals. The currently available injectable lipid emulsion formulations in the U.S. are made from a variety of oils. In the 1970s, the first generation ILEs were approved for use in the United States. First generation ILEs are composed of 100% soybean oil. They're a great source of energy, calories, and essential fatty acids. In 1984, a second generation ILE emerged outside of the US. It was a combination of soybean oil and medium chain triglyceride oil. The second generations were created to continue providing a good source of energy from medium chain triglycerides while trying to decrease the omega-6 fatty acid load from the 100% soybean oil and its potential inflammatory effects. In 1996, a third generation injectable lipid emulsion was created, made of 80% olive oil and 20% soybean oil. It wasn't marketed for use in the US until 2019. This third generation ILE continues to provide a great source of energy and adequate essential fatty acids while being inflammatory neutral. The fourth generation lipid injectable emulsions are those that contain fish oil. These lipid emulsions provide a higher amount of omega-3 fatty acids, specifically DHA and EPA, and a higher amount of alpha tocopherol. A 100% fish oil ILE has been used abroad and for compassionate use in the U.S. since the late 90s, early 2000s. It was approved for unrestricted use and marketing in the U.S. pediatric population um, just recently in 2018. Also, there's a multi-oil lipid injectable emulsion containing fish oil, olive oil, medium chain triglyceride oil, and soybean oil that was introduced to the market in 2016. This slide just shows the available U.S injectable lipid emulsion formulations and their relative inflammatory effects based on their soy source oil. The first generation ILEs composed of only soybean oil have more pro-inflammatory effects. MCT and olive oils have inflammatory neutral effects and fish oil has been shown to have the least pro-inflammatory effects. This um, chart is kind of busy. It simply illustrates the available U.S. injectable lipid emulsions and their contents of omega-6, omega-3, and omega-9 fatty acids, as well as alpha tocopherol content. Um, as you can see, the 100% soybean oil ILEs contain the highest amount of omega-6 linoleic acid and the lowest amounts of alpha tocopherol. The soybean and olive oil ILEs 
provide an adequate amount of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids and the highest amount of omega-9 oleic acid. Next on the list is the multi-oil ILE that's composed of, like I said, the soybean oil, MCT oil, olive oil, and fish oil. It provides the omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, which is different from the previous two generations, as well as high amounts of alpha tocopherol. Also of note is the omega-6, omega-3 fatty acid ratio of each ILE formulation. The lower the ratio, the more hypothetical anti-inflammatory effects the ILE will impart because there won't be as much competition for the enzymes in the metabolic pathway. What the slide does fail to illustrate is that soybean oil is also the highest in phytosterol content. This is followed by the olive oil soybean oil mix, the multi-oil ILE, and then the ILE with the lowest amount of phytosterols would be the 100% fish oil product. Great. So while the standard lipid emulsions, as well as these newer lipid emulsions that Beth just discussed, are vital, offer vital components in the diet, there are some instances where their use would be contraindicated. Um, obviously, an allergy to any ingredient in the ILE, whether that be soy for the soybean oil, but also olive oil, coconut, fish, shellfish, eggs, and peanuts would be other uh, situations where you would not be able to use one or more of the of these ILE. Um, at New England Life Care, we screen all of our patients for allergies to any of those above ingredients prior to initiation of use of the four oil um, emulsion. You also would not want to use this in situations where there are lipid disorders with a resultant increase in triglycerides, a thousand milligrams per deciliter or more. And then lastly, if you're going to be using the fish oil only, um, it would be contraindicated in patients with severe hemorrhagic disorders. So next we're gonna spend a little bit of time discussing the available products, um, then the indications for use, as well as some dosing guidelines. So the products that are currently available for use in the US by adults are the soybean oil, the soybean olive oil, the multi-use, I'm sorry, the multi-oil ILE. Um, these can be, the indications are a source of calories and essential fatty acids in situations where enteral nutrition or oral nutrition are not possible, um, insufficient, or contraindicated. So this chart, this table outlines some of the protocols for adults based on the manufacturing, manufacturer guidelines. Um, we know that dosing is always dependent on the individual's energy requirements, and those individual energy requirements would be influenced by the age of the patient, the body weight of the patient, and their clinical status. Um, we typically, as clinicians, look to Aspen, for example, for a recommendation um, for adult dosing. They typically uh, point to the one gram per kilo per day in our stable patients, and just slightly less than that for our critically ill patients, our trauma patients, or our septic patients. Um, it's important to note that fish oil is not currently approved for use in adults. Then we'll pivot over to the pediatrics. Um, the products currently available in the US for use in the pediatric population uh, include only soybean oil and fish oil. Um, as with, adults, so, um, as with adults, the soybean and fish oil are indicated for a use of, um, indicated for as a source of calories and as essential fatty acids. Um, the fish oil, which Beth mentioned earlier, was just cleared by the FDA in late 2018, um, is specifically indicated in pediatric patients with PN-associated cholestasis. Again, important to, important to note here that it is not indicated for the prevention of PNAC. Okay, here's my busy chart to go along with Beth's <laughs> busy chart. Uh, this table outlines dosing protocols for the pediatric patients based on manufacturer guidelines again. Um, like mentioned before, our lipid provision should be individualized based on age, weight, clinical status, and any other indices that might be of note for the patient. 
Um, but it does need to still adhere to both the clinical and manufacturer guidelines. Um, here you can see that they're laid out for preterm and term infants and adolescents and teens when we're talking about the soybean oil emulsion. And then they go for pediatrics in general with regard to um, the fish oil emulsion. The fish oil emulsion, um, I'm sorry, the soybean olive oil emulsion and the multi-oil emulsion are not currently approved for use in children. Okay, so moving on to the administration of ILEs and uh, parental nutrition in general. Um, parental nutrition is definitely a, a high-risk medication. It is a formulation that's, for, that's made from a multitude of ingredients, all of which could have incompatibilities or stability issues, um, and there's a great potential for error to occur at multiple steps in the parenteral nutrition process. Um, guidelines and recommendations are available and exist for all facets of the parenteral nutrition process, from ordering, how to order, how to label, from prescribing to compounding, labeling, and administration. Um, both Aspen and the Infusion Nurses Society are great references. They've developed guidelines and best practice recommendations that give an idea of, of what to follow. Um, the FDA, the CDC, and the U.S. Pharmacopeia are other organizations that provide guidance on different facets of the whole parenteral nutrition process. All commercially available lipid injectable emulsions can be administered either via a peripheral or a central venous access. They all available ILEs can be administered either, either alone as a separate infusion, or they could be mixed with other parenteral nutrition components into a total nutrient admixture or a TNA. Um, if they are mixed as part of a total nutrient admixture, the osmolarity of the final solution will determine the type of venous access that's required. Um, in general, solutions with an osmolarity of greater than or equal to 900 milliosmoles per liter must be infused through a central vein to avoid, um, to avoid any damage or adverse effects. All lipid injectable emulsions and total nutrient admixtures should be administered through a filtered, non-vented, non-DEHP infusion set. Um, the exception to this is if Omega Ven, the 100% fish oil ILE, is being infused directly from the manufacturer's glass bottle. Um, in that instance, a vented infusion set would be needed for administration. DEHP is simply a plasticizer that can leach into lipid solutions and could have uh, could be toxic to patients um, if used over long term or with long term accumulation. Um, this is nothing to worry about because commercially available PN infusion sets are all manufactured without DEHP. Um, so as long as you're using a, a set marketed for that, there's nothing, no issues there. Um, a 1.2 micron filter is required uh, when infusing ILE or if mixed into a, a TNA. Um, this is required to prevent the infusion of particulates or microorganism contamination or air emboli into the patient's veins. Um, while the 1.2 micron filter size still allows for the larger lip lipid particles to pass through. Uh, ILEs and total nutrient admixtures should definitely be administered via an infusion pump so that they can, the rate of infusion can be controlled. Um, this helps to avoid any adverse events from a too rapid infusion of either lipids or electrolytes um, in general. And it is recommended that lipid injectable emulsions that are infused separately hang for a maximum of 12 hours. Uh, this is in regards, this is recommended in regards to the fact that lipid is a really great bacterial medium. And if 
the, the thought is that if um, they're hung for a longer period of time, the chance of bacterial contamination increases. Um, there is a maximum recommended infusion time of 24 hours for all ILEs and um, mixed into a total nutrient admixture. Lipid injectable emulsions can be mixed into the total nutrient admixture, as we've said, but do, you do need to adhere to stability and sterility guidelines that are um, different guidelines of which are issued by the FDA, the CDC, the um, ILE, and other parental nutrition component manufacturers, and U.S. Pharmacopeia. Um, lipid injectable emulsions can easily be destabilized when mixed into a total nutrient admixture. Um, two things that have a very large impact on that stabilization are an acidic pH, um, specifically less than five, or potentially um, an inappropriate electrolyte content, specifically an excessive load of cations. Um, the positive charges could negate the negative charge that keeps those lipid particles kind of suspended in the emulsion and cause clumping or um, or particle formulation that could be formation that could be harmful to a patient. Um, the proper order of mixing of a total nutrient admixture should always be followed to avoid these instability risks. Uh, for example, it is not okay to to mix acidic dextrose solution directly uh, and directly add a lipid emulsion to that or vice versa. Um, all right. Um, so hold on one sec. I think I skipped over, skipped over one. <laughs> So as far as uh, total nutrient admixture stability guidelines, um, Aspen recommendations, which are based on, on information and studies done with soybean oil, ILE, have recommendations about final concentrations in a total nutrient admixture. Um, the con these concentrations have been demonstrated to give the best chance of compatibility and, and stability available. Um, dextrose concentration should be greater than or equal to 10%. It is recommended that amino acids in a concentration of greater than or equal to 4% and a soybean oil ILE concentration greater than or equal to 2% um, guidelines be followed to, to ensure the most stable uh, total nutrient admixture. If the mixture is mixed in accordance with the USP chapter 797 guidelines and under aseptic conditions, the beyond use date assigned to the total nutrient admixture could be up to nine days from preparation with proper storage. When using the alternative inter intravenous lipid emulsions, um, ma the manufacturers and their medical information teams specifically um, may need to be consulted for stability information. I myself have reached out to the alternative uh, manufacturers and definitely there is, there is information available um, and we do commonly mix the alternative ILEs in a total nutrient admixture here in our practice. When the stability of the total nutrient admixture might be of concern based on the patient's metabolic needs, um, there does exist commercially available multi-chamber bag parenteral nutrition options. Um, MCBPN is the abbreviation for, for these products. Um, they are manufactured shelf-stable preparations that are activated by the patient or the staff just prior to infusing. And kind of the, the risk of incompatibility or instability concerns are removed with the use of these products. They also, because of the commercially available um, nature of them, tend to have a long shelf life with room temperature storage. Um, and once again, they're activated just prior to infusion. So these could be an option for some, for some patients. Currently, the, there's two manufacturers in the U.S. 
that do supply MCBPN. Um, there are both a two-chamber product that contain just dextrose and amino acids, and three-chamber products that have dextrose, amino acids, and ILE. Um, the currently available products do contain soybean oil. They're available in various volumes, various concentrations, and they both come either with or without electrolytes added. Um, currently, the MC, there are MCBPN products that utilize some alternative lipid sources like the third and fourth generations that are in development, and we should hopefully see options on the market in the near future. This chart is simply an illustration, the currently available options for MCBPN and their indications and approved population, just for your reference. All right, one additional administration concern regarding um, lipid emulsions that comes up frequently involves repackaging for infant and neonate use. Um, the best practice is to infuse the ordered doses of ILE direct from the manufacturer's container, separate from, um, and this is, I'm going to back up for one second and say infant and neonate use. I'm thinking of, um, I'm, I'm speaking of infusing the ILE separate from a parenteral nutrition solution. So in this instance, the best practice is to infuse that separate injectable lipid emulsion um, direct from the manufacturer's container. But we all know that the doses needed for infants and neonates are often super small volumes. Um, and repackaging them can avoid waste and any potential for infusion errors um, if we repackage them into smaller containers for dosing. And this is often done into syringes. Um, if repackaging is necessary, definitely it should be performed aseptically following USP Chapter 797 guidelines. And any repackaged injectable lipid emulsion should only be hung for a maximum of 12 hours. Um, if a 24-hour continuous infusion is needed for the patient, then two containers should be prepared and a new tubing used with, with each one um, and changed every 12 hours. Okay. Um, reported adverse events to soy oil injectable lipid emulsions include hyperlipidemia, hypercoagulability, thrombophlebitis, and thrombocytopenia. Um, in clinical trials of the soy olive oil ILE and multi-oil ILE, there also had been reports of nausea, vomiting, hyperglycemia, hypoproteinemia, flatulence, and potentially abnormal LFTs. Um, other complications could include fat overload syndrome. This is a complication associated with rapid intravenous immusion, uh, administration of fat, intravenous infusion of fat in both in adults and children, it's been demonstrated. It could occur when the rate or the dose of lipid infusion is, it exceeds the body's ability to clear it. Um, and this can result in hypertriglyceridemia, jaundice, respiratory distress, fever, lethargy, um, hepatosplenomegaly, and potentially spontaneous hemorrhage. Um, fat overload syndrome is definitely rare, and it can usually be treated successfully by stopping the lipid infusion. Um, refeeding syndrome is another well-documented condition that results in potentially life-threatening you know, shifts from the fluid and electrolytes in and out of cells as well as alterations in the metabolism um, after, after we rapidly <clears throat> reintroduce nutrition to a patient who may have been without enteral or parenteral nutrition support for an extended period of time. Um, refeeding syndrome can occur in both adults or pediatric patients, and basically conservative introduction of nutrition support following Aspen guidelines can help prevent the occurrence of refeeding syndrome. Um, another, uh, another, I guess I should say catheter-related bloodstream infections are next on the list, and those are, are somewhat self-explanatory, um, essentially infusing parenteral nutrition or intravenous lipid emulsion direct into the vein 
can definitely increase the risk of contamination or bacterial infections as nutrients are very, um, it's a very rich source of nutrients for bacteria as well as humans. Um, so really following guidelines using aseptic technique and only infusing sterile prep preparations can help reduce the incidence of catheter-related bloodstream infections. Um, another notable complication of, of lipid use is Essential, or the abil abil inability <laughs> to utilize ILE is essential fatty acid deficiency. Um, I'll discuss this just a little bit more in the next slide. All right. So again, we're going to go back to that busy diagram, super basic diagram of fatty acid metabolism for the omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9 fatty acids. Um, Remember that they all utilize the same enzymes for metabolism, and the concentrations of the available fatty acids in the bloodstream will in, or in the diet will influence these pathways. Um, if the essential fatty acids, linoleic and alpha-linolenic acid, are not available, these enzymes will metabolize, um, I'm sorry, if they are available, the enzymes will metabolize those first. And so we'll see the production of very little mead acid from an omega-9 pathway. Um, if the essential omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are not available in a sufficient quantity, the enzymes will shift and they'll metabolize omega-9 oleic acid instead, and we'll see the concentration of mead acid increase. So looking through a little more info, arachidonic acid is a tetraene that relates to its chemical structure. Mead acid is a triene, and if those terms sound familiar, <laughs> it's because if an essential fatty acid deficiency exists in patient's nutrition, the triene tetraene ratio or the mead acid arachidonic acid ratio will increase. And we can test this using a blood test. Um, a triene tetraene ratio greater than 0.2 will, will indicate an essential fatty acid deficiency. Um, clinical symptoms tend to tend to result after um, at levels higher than 0.2. I think clinic, some clinical symptoms are typically seen with a triene tetraene ratio of greater than 0.4, and they include dry skin, scaly rash, poor wound healing, um, hair loss, maybe an increased risk of infection, or in children we may see inadequate growth. Um, the amount of intravenous lipid emulsions to prevent essential fatty acid deficiency in adults uh, differ depending on what the source, what the source oil is in the ILE. Um, based on providing 4% of total energy from essential omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, you can see that the adult dose volumes required of the soybean olive oil mix and the multi-oil ILE are much greater than that of 100% soybean oil. Um, this could have implications on cost or other factors when choosing an alternative lipid injectable emulsion in practice. Great, so we know that TPN has been used in clinical practice for decades and the indications for its use are very well defined. Um, I think we tend to associate PN um, use mostly with its role in how it was revolutionary in um, the treatment of previously often fatal conditions like short bowel syndrome and intestinal failure. Um, we see it very frequently um, in the areas of gastroenterology for inflammatory bowel disease and motility disorders. We see it in the surgical domain for fistula or bowel obstructions. Um, and as always, TPN would not be indicated in an individual with a functional gut um, I know that when I was in school, we were taught that if the gut works, use it, and that certainly it would be appropriate um, in this situation. So in the home setting, we have to consider many factors that um, for those who work in an inpatient setting um, may not be in the forefront of your mind when you've got the patient right there um, in your institution. Um, first, we know that TPN can be cost prohibitive. We also know that there are really strict requirements set forth by insurance providers to ensure coverage. This barrier really needs to be um, overcome um, as part of 
the determination of a patient being able to come home with TPN. Um, we also know that the patient needs to be able to perform the therapy and they need to have the availability of appropriate support. Um, and the administration of PPN can be complex. Um, it's certainly doable, but it is complex. So the physical abilities like dexterity even, or vision for reading instructions, really needs to be assessed before they're in the home. We need to have appropriate vascular access that Beth discussed, discussed earlier. And we need to know that there's medical stability before we initiate uh, parental nutrition support. At New England Life Care, we have a policy that we call our home, our home start policy. And what we've done is we've utilized Aspen guidelines to help us determine whether or not it's safe for a patient to um, have TPN initiated in the home. It's really a review of patient medical history, current labs, patient interview, um, and many other um, things. So there's certainly additional other considerations to include. Um, proper training in the storage setup and administration. This might be as simple as having enough refrigeration space. Um, we often will come in um, to the situation where we have a patient who will need seven bags of TPN, but they also have three teenagers living at home, and there's no possible way they can fit all of that TPN in their fridge. Um, so we have to be looking for um, ways to, to overcome that whether it be providing a fridge or some changing up the delivery schedule. Um, instructions in the area of aseptic technique, compatibility of the additives and medications added to the TPN bag. Um, we need them to be able to recognize the complications associated with parenteral nutrition. Um, this might be recognizing symptoms of hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, signs and symptoms of dehydration, um, the presence of fever and chills, and then the ability to communicate that back to the clinicians that are managing their care. Um, and then lastly on this slide is the ability to visually inspect each bag of the PN solution prior to infusion um, so that they can recognize any unusual appearance of the parental nutrition or of the ILE. That's gonna go into a little bit more detail on that visual inspection. Um, to first off, just to review things that we've touched upon before. Um, safe, the, the same storage and administration conditions that, uh, that we mentioned earlier will apply to all total, total nutrient admixtures supplied to patients at home. Um, when they're prepare, prepared aseptically and following USP Chapter 797 guidelines, the admixtures can be given an assigned beyond use date of up to nine days, depending on the formula, and once again, consulting manufacturers and their medical information teams may be necessary to, to make an informed decision regarding your patient's particular formula. Um, home PN is, is shipped and stored under refrigeration, as Meredith mentioned earlier, and um, definitely patients must follow all, must follow an aseptic process for all manipulation, including, you know, adding multivitamins or famotidine to the bags of parental nutrition, spiking them with the appropriate tubing um, to avoid risk of, of contamination. Um, to jump a little bit, that visual inspection that patients um, should be kind of giving the bag a once over before infusing, there are, or patients or caregivers um, should be looking at some potential signs of instability in a, a PN solution that's been shipped and stored for a long period of time, or, or one that's been just prepared as well. Um, some potential signs of instability can include uh, something called aggregation, where droplets of lipid may, may kind of look like they're clumping together or coming together, but not quite clumping. Um, the bag at this point could be uh, gently agitated and kind of resuspend things into solution. Um, any color changes, major color changes, which might indicate creaming, um, where maybe a layer of, of grouped together lipid particles could be seen on top of the emulsion. It maybe would look like a film of a cream on, a, on top of a water layer. Um, creaming, typically, without dis huge discoloration, um, can be redispersed into the bag with gentle agitation. Um, 
if the patient had any visualization of, of some sort of particles or precipitate in the bag, um, that would be an indication that something wasn't right. Obviously, this is a bit more difficult to visualize in a creamy, white, total nutrient admixture, but the potential does exist. Um, and lastly, that the coalescence or cracking would be a, a really visible um, alteration in the in the bag itself. Um, usually, greatly discolored, either yellow, brown, brownish oil droplets um, seen in the solution, or a complete yellow, brownish layer on the surface of the total nutrient admixture. Um, and patients should be instructed that. This would not be safe to infuse. There's a potential for some particulate matter to make it into the bloodstream at this point. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about monitoring home parental nutrition support. Um, employing a multidisciplinary approach to care and service can really help mitigate the risks association um, with the administration of PN in the home setting. We know that the first nutrition support team was really identified in 1972 when a group of clinicians organized a team to look at the incidence of sepsis in hospitalized PN patients. And now we know that nutrition support teams work together across the country to improve the quality of care of our patients on PN with the goal of minimizing complications, optimizing their nutrition status, uh, managing any electrolyte derangements or abnormalities that come about, and then also reducing the total cost of care to the healthcare system. And that might mean avoiding use of PN in an improper situation. Um, the disciplines typically involved are a physician, a dietitian, a pharmacist, and a nurse. However, we often know that those involved in the responsibilities that are assigned to them um, are generally defined by the individual institution and the or the organization. Um, it can be influenced by multiple things. It might be influenced by what available clinical expertise they have. Um, it might be determined by the overall financial picture of the institution um, and the perception of value of the management of PN patients. Um, so the routine um, or the attributes of the nutrition assessment really involves the review of clinical documentation, patient interview, um, this should be pretty old hat for most of us dietitians on the call. We're going to be looking at the nutrition needs, so evaluating those energy protein needs, the hydration status, the weight trend, and the routine surveillance of lab indices. Um, we know that the routine and regular surveillance of labs is a significant component of patient care in this really complex population. So most patients at New England Life Care are discharged um, from the inpatient setting with labs ordered weekly. Um, but it's not uncommon to have cohorts of patients that might be getting them weekly or every two weeks or even monthly. Um, so lab frequency is guided not only by the stability of their lab, actual lab results, um, but also within the, um, the determination of what the patient's goal of care is. Um, we may have patients that are um, hoping to, to complete some goals that they have in life, but they don't, um, but they know that this is not going to, to, haste, uh, to prevent them um, their death. Um, so we don't, may not draw labs on them at all. And so we have to look at every individual um, situation. We don't know that monitoring, allows, monitoring labs allows the regular review of fluid status, electrolyte abnormalities, any metabolic complications that present themselves, and glucose management. So again, the series of chemistries are identified and evaluated when therapy is initiated, but they tend to decrease in frequency as we see less liability um, in the results of those labs. So this is just a chart monitor uh, showing what we are monitoring in the home. The standing TPN labs um, typically include a CBC with diff, a CMP, a magnesium, a phosphorus, a triglycerides, and a prealbumin. Um, it's also not unusual, though, if you're working with a managing or prescribing physician, that they may order something that's outside of that list from time to time. Um, you might commonly see someone ordering an A1C in a diabetic patient or iron studies um, in patients who, who they're at risk for um, anemia, for example. For long-term TPN patients, we often will check their vitamin and trace element levels every six months. However, we may check sooner if there's a presentation of an unusual symptom or we're concerned about an essential fatty acid deficiency um, or some other issue. 
So we do have one adult case study that we're going to go over quickly. Um, we're going to talk about JM, who's a 47-year-old male who's been on home TPN since March of 2014. He originally presented to the hospital in 2013 with pain and ability to tolerate an oral diet. Um, his original diagnosis was presumed to be autoimmune pancreatitis with recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis, um, but his case was complicated by acute mesenteric ischemia, necrotic bowel, SMA thrombosis. He went on to have multiple um, resections and abdominal surgical procedures, ultimately developing um, an intracutaneous fistula, several of them actually. So here in this chart, we've highlighted in yellow um, some of the, the notable um, lab indices as well as dates in time um, for what happened with this gentleman. Um, so his weight trend in labs remained mostly stable for the first year of service. So from March of 3000, 2014 to 2015, he remained pretty stable. However, he did have a, a pretty precipitous rise in T. Billy in March of 2015 that necessitated a decrease in lipid um, to mitigate those risks of PN-associated liver disease in what we knew to be a long-term TPN patient. Um, we dropped him down to, originally, we attempted to do things like you know, three days a week or 50 grams twice a week to make sure that we were following guidelines preventing, per, for preventing a essential fatty acid deficiency. However, even that was not helping his lab. So the doctor allowed him to have a little yogurt and, and any other selections that might be tolerated to provide some fat. Um, and that did work for, for quite a while, um, a couple of years. However, it led to a significant decrease in weight um, due to the calorie reduction associated with the removal of lipid. So if you look at that bottom line, you'll see that he went from, when he started TPN, he had a uh, BMI of 23.5 all the way down in March um, when we see us, uh, his labs um, significantly increase. His BMI at that point was a 17.2. Um, in March of, let's see, in July of 2017, um, we started SMOS lipid. This is when it became available to New England Life Care. Um, we started him on that after verifying that there were no potential allergies. Um, and both his labs and his weight improved over the next year. Um, he became eligible at that point to be placed on the bowel transplant list where he is today. Um, and at, this, at the time of this, this discussion, he continues to receive TPN um, with SMOF lipid daily, and he's doing well. So we hope that you are lucky enough to enjoy your lipid the old-fashioned way. Um, here's how we do it up here in Portland, Maine. Um, we wanted to thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you stay safe and healthy. And it looks like we might have time for some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Meredith and Beth. And I'm sure everybody was taking a good look at a lobster, good old Maine lobster roll with some fries right at lunchtime. Perfect timing. So we do have a couple of questions coming in, um, and I'll just encourage people to just send your questions in. If we don't have time, we will get back to you um, after the webinar. We have time for a couple of questions. So a uh, great case study. I really liked um, how you kind of showed one of the things for changes. So you did highlight uh, many times we see pre-albumin being monitored in many home uh, PM patients as a marker of nutritional status. Can you speak to this and whether it's still needed lab for monitoring that or if there's a better indication indicator of overall nutrition status? Um, I can take that one. Um, I think that, you know, we still check it every week if we have a, um, a patient that's on weekly labs or every other week lab. Um, and I think it's a useful tool. Um, however, we do find that it, it often is low because these patients have so many other issues going on. Um, and I personally, and I think the dietitians here on our team, um, don't use that as the only indicator of the adequacy of nutrition support. Uh, we may be looking at the weight trend if our patient is gaining weight, um, but their pre-albumin is low. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to increase calories. Um, we also are looking at 
their overall hydration status and any other inflammatory markers that may be going on. Um, so I think that it's, it's useful in, in some situations, but in others, um, it would not certainly be the, the end-all, be-all indicator for us. Thank you. Can you discuss a little bit about some characteristics and principles that are needed to be considered for each lipid profile as it relates to determining uh, compatibility of some of the various uh, additives? Um, so I think that's kind of targeted towards towards me. Um, so the can you repeat the question, Jen? Sure. It's really just talking about compatibility with uh, various additives on the lipid profiles on the different lipid, lipid profiles. So would like a multivitamin for the standard lipid be appropriate for the alternative lipids as well? That type of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, in general, using the alternative lipid emulsions, the same kind of guidelines would, um, or the same kind of, there's a lot of compatibility and stability that's established with soybean lipid em emulsion. Um, and in general, yes, the guidelines that are that have been tested and proven um, are still still should be followed with alternative lipid emulsions. Um, there is actually some thought that these newer alternative lipid emulsions that contain medium chain triglycerides or other forms of oils might actually impart a little bit better um, stability of an unstable compound. Um, lipids in general to, to take it is an oil and water mixture and it's kind of complicated to um, to have to emulsify, to, to make it into an emulsion that can be infused intravenously without separating. Um, there has been a, a testing done by Driscoll et al. that's published in an older um, Aspen journal that does show that maybe these newer lipid emulsion products might actually have some better compatibility or stability due to the mixture of different oils and not all being long chain polyunsaturated oils. So I hope that helps to answer that question. Thanks a lot, Beth. Yeah, that's a complicated question. I appreciate your feedback on that. And then it looks like I have um, one more coming in here. We'll take this as the last question. In your experience, um, I know you talked a little bit about it in the case study, but what are one or two key triggers to begin the process of evaluating a switch in ILE products for a home PM fusion? Well, at New England Life Care, we have a little bit of an, of a, of an easier situation. We um, have the standard soybean emulsion, a couple different ones that we use. Um, and then we also provide the, the four oil emulsion um, we have not ever utilized the um, soybean olive um, product, um, and then we have we have used Omega Ven, for example, or the 100% fish oil um, in infants with intestinal failure. Uh, but we actually did not provide the ILE. That was it was back when it was still used under compassionate use, and it was provided by the hospital um, as part of um, some studies. Um, but with regard to when we decide whether or not to use SMOS or use the four oil emulsion, we typically are looking at uh, liver function tests and T-Billy. We're looking at triglyceride levels um, and, and looking at those trends. Sometimes we'll, um, we'll go in favor of just decreasing the, the, the total lipid that we provide. We may go from providing it on seven days a week down to three days a week, for example. Um, whereas in other situations where someone maybe has a tenuous weight trend, um, we might look to maximize the calories that are being provided by um, the lipid. So we, we would switch to something so that we could keep the calories stable. Um, the same with, with something like um, looking at the glucose infusion rate. If taking out some of the fat makes the um, GIR too high or the patient's hyperglycemic, again, we might choose in addition to having um, less than ideal uh, liver labs or hepatic labs, we would 
um, potentially look at us utilizing the, the multi-source oil for that as well. Great, thank you. That was our last question today. Uh, many thanks to Beth and Meredith for sharing your expertise and to Presenters Cabby for their generous sponsorship of this program via a medical education grant. For more information on this topic, make sure to check out next month's issue of Infusion Magazine for a 12-page document on this very topic. As a quick reminder, in order to get CE, please follow the link in the follow-up email to take a short quiz within 24 hours. We thank you and all of our providers and suppliers who are working on the front lines to keep patients safely in their homes. We're looking forward to bringing you more education. Tune in in October for our weekly COVID series. Thank you again, and everyone have a great day. Thank you.